Welcome to the A16Z podcast. I am Michael Copeland, and we have in the room our man in Barcelona, Benedict Evans, who is back now from Mobile World Congress. Benedict, welcome Hello. back. Hello. All right, let's talk about Mobile World Congress. It, it is the largest gathering of what these days? Um, it's something like ninety to 100,000 attendees, um, and it is the annual global trade fair for the mobile telecoms industry. So all the people who sell stuff to telcos, which is about a $1.2 trillion industry, so over double the size of the entire online advertising and the entire advertising industry for context and something like 10 times the size of the online advertising industry. So it's a big industry and it's a big trade fair and it's everything from billing software to base stations to um, handsets to camera sensors to every single bit of that value chain. There, there's always been hand wringing over Mobile World Congress versus, you know, CES and other things. And what's what's common in both of those massive gatherings is that Apple doesn't show up, or at least Apple doesn't show up officially. Um, so we we hear about all the gadgets that come out of there. It's a sort of Android world, really, is what it's come to, or it used to be the Nokia world. But put that in context. Like, what what does Mobile World Congress wrap its arms around these days? And what does it start to look like? Well, it's an interesting shift. I mean, I first went in 2001 as a baby analyst, and it was probably a tenth of the size. And it was in Cannes, which was kind of a cold, rainy French provincial town. Did your parents have to take you? Or did, they, did they chaperone you? Or no? no, although there was an urban legend about somebody whose assistant booked him a flight to Caen in the north of France, <laughs> um, which is, if you don't know, if you know the spelling, it looks kind of similar. Right. Um, and so um, you went there and you saw all the new stuff. You saw the new phones and you saw, oh my God, phones with cameras and phones with color screens and maybe Java. And, you know, this was the point that everything was kind of taking off. And it was also just a year after the um, European 3G spectrum auctions when European operators to spend about 110 billion euros on Spectrum to do mobile data services. And I kind of I wrote a blog post about this kind of two weeks ago saying like it didn't you didn't really know at the time, this is 2001, it was going to take until 2007 before you actually had a phone that could really do this stuff well. First consumer, really good consumer 3G phones outside Japan took till 2005. The iPhone was 2007. It really took till 2000 and 10 before smartphone sales really started exploding. Here we, here we are 2015, we're 15 years later and we're only just at the point that kind of everybody's got one of these things and using it, well over half of the western population of the developed world has got one of these things and, and is starting to use it so it kind of took a long time Does 110 billion for Spectrum, you know at the time people thought it was crazy looking back if you had known that it was going to take that long a, you know, a time and you were a telco, does that seem like a good way to spend your money? I mean, I haven't done the ROI, but I don't think any of the business cases that people had had in mind worked out. And of course, part of that is that the telcos all had these sort of strategic visions of everything that was going to be done on mobile phones. And, you know, they they had Facebook and Instagram and mobile banking and all of this stuff in mind. But of course, they thought they'd all be doing it. And they thought they would be were driving, they thought they'd be making money from it. And they thought they'd be selling extra data plans from it. And they're not making any money from it. So they built, they spent all the money and they built all the network. And their revenue has been you know, the European operators, the revenue has been flat down for over a decade. So, I mean, this is the kind of the thought that I had is if I was to go back from 2016 to 2001 and kind of explain what was going to happen, you know, what would I have said and would anyone have believed it? Like, it's going to take a decade for this stuff really to start working. When it does, all the crazy lunatic visions will happen for billions of people. Right. But it will, won't be done by Nokia or Microsoft. It will be done by this second-tier South Korean electronics company, Samsung. And this has been an American computer company that you may vaguely remember from the 80s called Apple Computer. Oh, yeah, they were <laughs> groovy. I remember them. And none of the telcos will get any benefit from this at all, except in the USA they'll manage to sell a lot of data plans because the market's not very competitive. But the European carriers won't make any of this. And Finland and Japan will stop mattering. And would anyone have believed, like, and like the portal model won't work. Like, people thought the AOL model was going to work for telcos. They didn't realize that it wasn't even going to work for AOL. And so, like, the future took longer and looked very different. And there's a kind of an interesting tension point here. And, like, all the conceptual stuff happened. Like, all the amazing visionary stuff that people babbled about and visionaries and futurologists and so on said was going to happen. It all happened. Right. But it took a lot longer. And all the people who thought they were going to make money from it didn't make any money from it at all. 
So I thought that, but I just thought I was kind of casting my mind back and thinking about how it all happened, but it all kind of ended up looking different from how we expected. And then looking at, you know, kind of bringing up to the present day where, you know, it used to be that all the stuff was announced there. And then Apple obviously pulled the announcements elsewhere and Samsung pulled its announcements elsewhere. This year, a lot of new stuff was announced. Right. So, we saw all this, this like modular phones. It was kind of a throwback to, you know, in some ways shrugging off the the kind of, I don't know, bounds of, of the iPhone. Like, let's try something different. Yeah, I think there's a bit of that. I mean, LG has got a modular thing. Um, Sony is kind of really kind of thinking about how to create kind of more of a lifestyle brand around its products. Um Samsung basically had the S6s in the S7. It like it's yes, it's better, but it kind of looks the same as last year's model, which is you know it's fine, but it's not changing the world. Um, and then everybody piling into VR, right. Um, right? Which is sort of a function of the dynamic of the Android market, which is everyone selling a commodity product with commodity components and a commodity operating system. So, what are you going to do? Well, obviously you should do VR. Right. Um, and so Samsung has evolved the gear. Um, LG has a VR headset that's actually tethered from your phone, which is kind of interesting. Um, HTC um, has a VR headset that's actually tethered from a high-end PC, so it's an eight hundred dollar headset. So it directly competes with the the uh, Oculus headset, right, um, which Oculus. is and both of which will be out this this spring or this summer. Or the something. Vive, although is that how you pronounce it? It seems uh, like a bad like it's Vive a name or that Viv or yeah, Vive Vivre, or, uh, you know, it's like Revive. Uh, yes, yeah, so I had the demo. It's cool. It works. It's two thousand dollars. It's seven eight hundred dollars plus like a fifteen hundred dollar PC. Oh wow! Um, which is ball same ballpark as the Oculus, and so VR. It's interesting, like. Everyone's piled into VR, but I think it's as Chris Dixon made this point. It's like you have the high-end product, which is very expensive and still not like where you want it to be in the long term in terms of like pixel density and so on. And then you have a low-end product at a high-end price, which is what you get on cardboard or smartphones and so on, which is you still got a – well, not not, not high-end price. You, 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 get, you get this cheap headset, right, you, but you're not getting the high-end product. Right, but you have, you have your smartphone and you get – yeah, but it's carbon. you know it's not it's not a, the experience that you really want from which is what you get from what you sort of get from Oculus and Vive today and will get from that over the next couple of years, and so there's this kind of sense of like let's kind of hurry up and wait somewhere else um, okay. from the smartphone guys um, in that the experience is there but it's not kind of the, the this is like the V1 and this is the test and the demo that makes you think okay this is going to be interesting. But it's not what you want yet. It's kind of Do, like the pre-iPhone. And so you think experience. the handset guys are getting there because they believe that, that that that's where VR goes is to the handset. Yeah. So I, you know, I, my kind of my sort of basic thesis is clearly it's not it's not going to be a two thousand dollar product for it to be mass market, and it's probably got to be on your smartphone. Um, and it's got to be a lot better than the experience is now, and that means it's going to take a couple of years. And so. In two, three, four, five years' time, depending on what you think you need and what you think the roadmap looks like, this becomes a kind of a standard part of mid to high end high end smartphones um, with a headset. Um, and then everything gets built off the back of that. Um, and there may also be a games console product. So obviously there's the HoloLens where they just announced their dev kit at I think three thousand dollars, two or three thousand dollars. I think it's three thousand dollars. And then there's a rumored Sony product for a games console as well. But you know, again, this is a this is a little bit a while out. Um, and so, you know, you go, you have the demo, you think this is astonishing, this is part of the future, um, and it will, no question it will be part of the future. It's not quite here yet. Right. Given how handset makers make money or don't make money, how does the VR help them? I mean, are they going to, again, are they going to try to sell games? Well, or then like... you, you get this question, like, is, does this become a condition of entry? Like, you know, you buy the Samsung one over the HTC one because it has this, over the LG one because it has the Gear VR. And you may not use it a lot, but you buy it a bit and you get like, you, know, you cream off another bit of the high end market. Um, and so you get this kind of subordinate question of, well, how long is Apple going to stay out of this? The product right now is probably not what Apple would want to sell, but do they leave it open to the Android market and to Google for the next two, three, however long until they think they can get it perfect? Um, you, know, you know, we'll see. They'll be, my suspicion is they'll wait a while. Apple tends to be kind of a fast follower in this right. stuff and then come in with what they hope is kind of a market defining product. Well, and the rumor is that they're, they're hiring like mad and working on something. Apparently. So, yes. So, but we'll see. Um, and, but I thought there was kind of an interesting contrast because on the one hand, you have these kind of jumps into the future. The probably the most kind of interesting or kind of interesting company for kind of what it symbolizes is something I found in the kind of the back alleys. And I mean, this is kind of the point of Mobile World Congress is you just walk and walk and walk. So my watch test, my smartwatch tells me that I did 38 miles in four days of just walking and looking. The company, so the company I met um, is a Algerian family owned conglomerate as just kind of common story from middle income markets um, um, in the cement business. Um, then they got into the white goods business, fridges and washing machines and so on, their own factories and so on, making them. 
um, built up a chain of 150 stores around Algeria selling these. Then they get into what we call brown goods, so TVs, um, making TVs, which, again, you buy the panels from LG and put them together. Right. Then they get into smartphones. What's the brand uh, typically uh, for this company? So they now their smartphone brand is Condor, and right. Condor has a third of the Algerian market. Oh, wow. More than any other player in the market. And this is, that's so fine, so that's Algeria. And so, but what this symbolizes is this question of what happens to the future of the Android OEM space. Because, um, so Samsung cloned Nokia. Um, you know, you get people in the Valley say they, they cloned Apple, and then they cloned Nokia. In the sense of every handset, every price point, every technology, every frequency, every operator, every sales channel, sales channel in particular. So it's in, it's on the street in Bogota and, you know, rural, wherever you can get a Samsung phone. And that only took them so far. But in parallel, what's happened is that the smartphone industry has kind of turned into the PC industry of the 80s in that you have um, commodity components, commodity operating system, and a 1,000 people piling in trying to work out how to do this. It's like the PC clones. And um, so the question is, like, what does the value chain look like once you leave the factory gate in China? Um, Where does it go? Who sells it under what brand? How do you get that phone at, say, anything from $40? And incidentally, the entry price of an Android, 3G Android phone now with half a gig of memory is probably 40 to 50, no, 25 to $30 wholesale. And then 4G is more like $40. And that's, you know, it's not a great experience, but it's not bad, especially not at that price. And so here is the thing. So you have Condor buying some components and putting them together in Algeria and selling them through their chain of 150 shops. And who else has got 150 shops shops in Algeria that can sell phones? You know, not Xiaomi. Yeah, yeah probably no one. <laughs> um, I don't know, but not Xiaomi. And so then you, so you have them. And then you have Wico in France, which has built a distribution in France. The phones are made in China. They brand and sell them in France. You have Micromax in India. You have Cherry Mobile in the Philippines. You have maybe a dozen other companies scattered all across this quadrant of some combination of making, designing, branding, and marketing, but above all else, being the guys who can actually put them into the hands of consumers. Do you sell online? Do you sell in shops? Do you have a strong consumer brand? Do you not? Do you change your software? How much do you change your software? How many people are trying to clone Xiaomi? And so, of course, Xiaomi had these two innovations. One is change your software in a way that makes Android kind of differentiated. And two, have a completely new route to market in terms of kind of online flash sales. Turns out an awful lot of people are trying to clone the software approach. And it's not yet clear whether the online flash sales model will work outside China. They've tried to make it work in India. They've done okay. It clearly hasn't, ex- you know, they don't dominate the market there yet. But, you know, we'll see. And then you have, you know, Apple kind of sitting out at one end of that, which is they don't own any of the factories, but they do. They design the whole thing and the branding and the marketing and the distribution and everything else. And so they're kind of right in one corner of whatever that quadrant would look like. Um, And then you have a whole bunch of people who go to Foxconn and say, we'll have number seven and number 15, please. And can you make it green and silk screen our logo on the back? Right. Which, to to your point, the PC clone days were just like that. And in some ways, you you, you know, you could build build your own, but you almost didn't care until, you know, I was a gamer or I was a business person or I was. And then somehow they tended to make the PC. It's not a perfect analogy because the PC cloners did tend to put them together themselves. Right. Whereas a lot of these companies, you find these companies aren't putting them together themselves. Although, the, you know, with the example of Condor, actually, they are putting the thing together themselves or half of it. Right. You know, they're sort of half, they do about half the work, they say. Um, what you then have, or what you haven't yet had, is kind of the Dell. Uh-huh, um, uh-huh. That is to say, the company that comes along and says, do you know what? This is kind of a crappy, low margin business, and we're going to love that and be that. And we're going to create the business model that wins in that world. Um, and we haven't quite had that. But what I thought was interesting coming back to Condor is like, if you're in the cement business, what margin do you think is a great margin to make? <laughs> well, <laughs> now, then if you yeah. are in the consumer, if you are then in the handset business, what margin do you think is a great margin to make? And if you're in consumer electronics what mar- or TVs, what margin right. is a great margin to make? I'm just guessing, and I don't know this for sure. I'm guessing the margin even in TVs is better than the margin in cement. Well, that's a bad example because the TV is like it's like half a point. No, no one makes any money. No one makes any money in TVs. Yeah. But it's kind of my point is you have um, a question of um, you know total commodity product. Can you create some differentiation around brand, around the design of the handset, around the software that you load onto it, maybe using Cyanogen, which is our portfolio company, to create something nice on top of Android? But how do you put it into customers' hands? How do you build the support 
customer support so that if there's a problem, people can get it, get it resolved? And how far do you need to do that? Um, how far do you need to make it as opposed to be which bits of that value chain do you need to put in place? And, you know, that is completely open at the moment. You described this family from Algeria that makes, you know, from cement now to smartphones in the Condor brand. Google doesn't have the answer to this question either. Google's decided to like, you know what? We can't do it the way we were doing it. We're going to bring it more in-house and do our own. So it's well, a tricky this, question, this, clearly. This great observation that, that Sundar Pinchai made, who was then running Android and is now running Google, um, made this kind of point that, you know, when Samsung dominated Android, people said, gee, Sundar, you've got a big problem. Samsung dominates Android. And now that Samsung doesn't dominate Android, people are saying, gee, Sundar, you've got this big problem. Like, you know, all these other companies coming up. Right. I mean, I, you know, I have a, you know, have my sort of, this is sort of a separate conversation, but like, clearly there is a question within this for Google, which is like, does given like the kind of the, the fundamental shift as we went from one of the fundamental shifts as we went from the desktop internet to the mobile internet was that the smartphone itself is the platform and therefore the operating as opposed to the web browser. And so you are very often you're targeting the smartphone and the smartphone operating system itself becomes a user acquisition model. So the platform, whereas Windows wasn't, you know, Microsoft couldn't do stuff that changed how different websites could access their customers. Google could, but Microsoft couldn't and Apple couldn't. Whereas on a smartphone, the operating system owner is actually doing stuff. And so it matters to some extent for Google what the Android world looks like because that may mean that stuff Google want to do or other people wants to do may affect how people get to Google. And obviously you see this with what Apple is doing in iOS, that they do stuff that routes people away from Google not necessarily out of kind of aggression, but just because it's, that's kind of the natural flow of the product evolution. And so you do get this question, well, what is the Android world going to look like? And does right. that, how does that affect Google? Does it do, do you get lots of people trying to kind of change Android? Do you get lots of people just saying, you know, we're going to take the latest Cyanogen build and we're going to do put, you know, preload three apps and put a logo on the front and that's and we're done. My suspicion is probably more the latter than the former, but um, it just kind of poses this interesting question of, you know, what is all this stuff going to look like? And you know, in the long term, you know, there are, say, there's probably less than 300 million phone PCs were sold last year. That will drop down to probably 200 to 250 million PCs being sold. And there's one and a half billion PCs on Earth, maybe, maybe a bit less. And that might drop down to one and a quarter, maybe even one. And there are two billion phones being sold as opposed to, so you'll go to a world and that will rise a bit. Um, and so you will go to a world in which there are 4 billion, maybe 5 billion people with a mobile phone, most of which will be running iOS or Android. And sales of iOS and Android devices every year of over 2 billion units. And so the unit sales of iOS and Android will be 10x the sales of PCs. And the install base will be probably 5x the install base of PCs. And what that world looks like is kind of, you know, we don't quite know yet. Is that going to look like the world of white goods? You know, is it going to look like the world of TVs? Is it going to be lots and lots of like regional players? Is there going to be a Brazilian company that just has a quarter of the market in Brazil? Or are there going to be two that have two thirds of it between them? What is that? How is that all? How is all of that going to shake out? Will it be Samsung? Will it be Lenovo, Huawei? Will it be, you know, do we move to a world where there's just lots and lots and lots of companies doing this? Do we move to a world where manufacturing happens, you know, outside of the places it happens now too? Or is that just so locked down now that you think there's not much chance well of that it's shifting. interesting as the, you know you could argue i don't have a strong view on this you could argue that as the product becomes more commoditized and it becomes you know these three chips plus this screen plus this piece of injection molding plus this about so on and so on and so on that you you have less need for the kind of the cluster of expertise that you have in Zen. right and that's more of like certainly like the assembly may move outside china um, that's certainly happened in some other sectors. It may do. I don't, I don't have a strong view on that. Um, certainly, you can start seeing that happen for some of these companies, like, you know, Condor yeah. is doing half of the work in, they say, doing half the work in Algeria. You know, we'll see. Um, it may do. Um, and, you know, Shenzhen may, may move on to kind of higher margin, you know, may move up the value chain just as has happened in, in other industries. But it just kind of fascinates me to just kind of see, like, on the one hand, you have the VR world and this kind of super high-end vision of the future. On the other hand, kind of scurrying around in the kind of hall six and seven, you've got these other guys building this kind of completely different question as to like, it's not the technology. It's like, who owns the shop in the third tier market town in Mozambique? Right, right, right. 
Was there anything else that you could, you know, we talked, we began this conversation about kind of your early days and the early days of Mobile World Congress. Do you get a sense of, and, and you know, the telcos paying this massive amount of, you know, money for Spectrum that turns out didn't actually turn into a great business for them. Is there a group that's ascendant and, and or descendant? Do you get a feeling like that it's, telco isn't really the thing, it's something else? Like, how does that express itself at, at Mobile World Congress? Um, well, what's happened is that the value kind of moves up the stack with each generation. And so it went from being the um, network operators who designed and built. I mean, back in the 80s, the network operators designed and built all the equipment, like Bell Labs made all the gear for, 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 um, for AT&T and right. NTT made half of their own equipment or the captive manufacturers did. And so that got disaggregated. Um, and the telcos don't make their own equipment anymore. And then the guys who made equipment also made handsets. And it's kind of interesting that, you know, if you think back again 15 years ago, none of the companies that kind of created cellular are in the handset business anymore. Like none of them. They're all out of it. Like Nokia, Ericsson, Siemens, you know, Motorola. Um, all of those companies are out of the handset business. Samsung is the only one. And they were, yeah, they were there, but they weren't like one of the kind of primary creators of cellular technology. Samsung is almost the only brand name from 15 years ago that is still in the handset business pretty much. I mean, there may be another. I can't think of another right. one. Um uh, Bell Labs is now part of Nokia, incidentally, which is, you know, tells you how the world has changed because Bell Labs merged, Alc became Lucent, which merged with Alcatel and Alcatel yeah, Lucent, yeah. Nokia bought Alcatel Lucent's network business. Um, so that, that value moved up. But then the operating system moved away from the handset makers, except for Apple. And then the value moved, the services moved away from the operating system. And so you get this continual disaggregation moving up and up and up the stack. And then, you know, which is not kind of conversation for another day, then you look at what's happening on handsets. And it's like, okay, Facebook trying to move the disaggregate, Facebook trying to do what WeChat and to some extent Baidu have moved in China, which is move the discovery and acquisition and, you know, engagement, another layer up the stack from the operating system. Right. Um, and so we'll see at F8 and then IO and WWDC what Apple, Google, Facebook planned t to try and do around this Which stuff. all of those are lining up in the next couple of months, right? In the springtime, more or less. Or exactly, yes. So, and they're all sort of, you know, we keep circling around this question from on mobile of like, we are post Netscape and post PageRank. We moved on from the world where it was web browser and mouse keyboard. Um, but we haven't like got any stability on what that will look like. And this is not, incidentally, something that was anyone was really discussing on the show floor at Mobile World Congress. Um, but this is like the next question as to, Lou, what is the discovery acquisition engagement stack look like at the top of the stack? And then what layer appears above that, whether it's... You could argue it's AR or VR on the one hand. You could argue it's AI on the other. I mean, this is kind of my, joke. my kind of career is going to move from te te as my career started. I was in telecoms and it was all about five letter acronyms like WCDMA. Um, and then you move to tech and it's kind of three letter acronyms. And now it's like the three acronyms that matter are I AR, VR and AI. So it's now <laughs> two, two letter letters, acronyms. Right. That's funny. I want to just put in a plug for the uh, low end VR. I think that. You know, we talk here a lot about high end versus low end. If you haven't done the low end, go do it. I mean, it's it's. So, well, this is an, so. Here's an interesting aside. So, Samsung, both at CES and on their stand here, had a demo stand where you had like I think like thirty or forty seats. With it, you go, you queue up, you sit in the seat, you put the Gear VR on. The seat, the kind of stand, kind of moves around, and they play a roller coaster demo. And that was full the, every single day of the whole day at CES and full every single day the whole day at Mobile World Congress. Right. And you can do the kind of the, the back of the envelope mass on a okay, five-minute demo times four days or whatever the, the number is. But it kind of tells you it's interesting that, like, the people who are paying however many thousand dollars to go to this conference and stay in the hotel and who work full-time in this industry – are willing to queue for 15 minutes to have this demo because they haven't seen it yet. Yeah, no. I, I mean, never mind like quote unquote civilians or normal people or right. whatever you, muggles or whatever you want to call it, like, people <laughs> who don't work outside of tech. People inside tech haven't seen this yet. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool stuff. And so if you get a chance, go do it. Benedict, thank you. Uh, welcome back. Uh, and you're going to be leaving again soon and we'll talk more about where you go next. But uh, we will talk more about mobile. Thanks. Fantastic. <laughs>